Good morning and welcome everyone to PerfWeb 83, day one. Uh, these are scheduled as fireside chats. Uh, we're gonna do one lecture actually with discussion and then a uh, fireside chat with uh, Justin Kendrick, Senior VP and CEO Methodist, I mean, sorry, Memorial Hermann, the Woodlands Hospital. Good Lord, sorry about that. Uh, fortunately, I don't think he's watching just yet, so I don't really mess that up. Um, so let me get through our, our quick uh, notes, please. Contact us uh, at contact at perfusioneducation.com. You can see it down there on the scroll bar. Our call-in number is 832-239-5. 358 and let me repeat that for those of you that might be driving 832 239 5358 if you look down at our scroll bar we will be scrolling our social media for example our Facebook uh, where we would appreciate you liking us uh, and sharing us also on Twitter uh, we have the YouTube channel. It would be very uh, beneficial for us for you to become a subscriber and to click that notification button. Uh, we'd appreciate that. Um, so take a look at our scroll bar. It's got all of the appropriate information that you need. I'd like to briefly discuss our MediWeb app, our uh, critical care and uh, application for perfusionists. It has everything you would need it for doing your cases, uh, it's got a perfusion quick calc section, it's got ECMO section, hemodynamics, conversions, and an IV uh, dose rate calculator. Uh, that's also a standalone app. This app is $2.99. The other app is 99 cents. We've recently done some updates. I think we have some new updates coming. Uh, once you buy it, you get the updates for free. So there's no subscription fees. It's $2.99. I think it's a great value. We really worked hard on it, and we're going to continue to develop that. Uh, you can listen to our PerfWeb podcasts on any of your streaming, uh, your favorite streaming software like Spotify or Podbean, or uh, there's a variety of other ones, I believe, on the uh, Apple uh, iTunes as well. Uh, so please listen to our podcasts. Uh, social media app uh, and by the way we're going to be airing I think we're gonna are we gonna be airing live comments today yes. so anyone uh, watching that uh, and is it only YouTube or is it anything so, so only on YouTube so only the YouTube viewers if you want to make comments as you make those comments I will see them live uh, and try to respond to them uh, more quickly than what we have in the past and others can see your comments as well without me having to necessarily uh, say it out loud. Our social media uh, app pop-up, uh, I guess we could try that. Oh, that's the live comments, right. We can show you how that works. Well, we don't have to show everybody how that works. Let's just go ahead and get into this. So our first, there it is right there. So our, uh, our first session today is going to be on perfusion accidents. So let's go ahead and start with my slides. So uh, here's my title slide. Of course, I'm Joe Basha, perfusionist, been a perfusionist now for 43 years, um, still practicing, Not don't do as many cases as I used to do, but I still do cases, cover ECMO, initiate ECMO, change ECMO circuits. So I'm still active clinically uh, to uh, maintain my certification and my state license uh, in time. I, I imagine that will slow down, but it hasn't yet. So I still wanna keep that going if I can. But I wanna talk about perfusion accidents because there are, you know, we've ha heard several talks about this and there are near misses. There are things that happened uh, that were inconsequential and there are things that happened that were very consequential. The uh, uh, the uh, cases that I'm going to be discussing with you today actually resulted in a patient death, uh, either because of brain death or because of just death in general, but not one that was protracted. It was fairly immediate. 
So before we get into that, I wanted to talk about what is the word accident. And, you know, the whole sort of theme of my lecture today is going to be on us calling these things perfusion accidents. And I think it's important to mention that uh, some years ago, not terrible, not too many, but several years ago, um, David Wood of the Wood uh, Woods Insurance Group out of Phoenix, uh, which is now NFP, and they're you know the, one of the largest, if not the largest, perfusion uh, private practice insurance uh, providers in the country uh, that I'm aware of. And uh, we've been a customer of theirs for a very long time. And David gave a, he's the broker, and he gave a presentation uh, at the New Orleans conference. And he was talking about perfusion accidents. One of the questions that he asked the audience was, what, um, it, what is significant about the case when a perfusionist is sued for malpractice? What is the significance of the event that occurred and the lawsuit. And people had a variety of different comments, but what he wanted to illustrate is, it's when there's a, when there's a perfusion accident, especially resulting in death, it's usually, if not always, the last case that that perfusionist ever does. And uh, I thought that was very significant, but getting back into this, I need to take my glasses up to read this. Um, definition of an accident. Well, it's an unforeseen and unplanned event or circumstance. Their meeting was an accident, sort of by chance. Lack of intention or necessity, chance. They met by accident rather than by, by design. An unfortunate event resulting especially from carelessness or ignorance was involved in a traffic accident. Now, for those of you who don't know me very well, I was a police officer at one time, and we didn't call them traffic accidents. We called them traffic collisions. We never used the term traffic accident because they were collisions, not accidents. There was always a reason. Um, in the medical lexicon, an unexpected and medically important bodily event, especially when injurious, for example, a cerebrovascular accident, a CVA. In law, it's an unexpected happening causing loss or injury, which is not due to any fault or misconduct on the part of the person injured, but for which legal relief may be sought. And informally in the United States, uh, used euphemistically to refer to an uncontrolled or involuntary act or instance of, for example, urinating or defecating as by a baby or a pet. The puppy had an accident on the rug. Uh, and a non-essential property or quality of an entity or circumstance. For example, the accident of nationality. I was born in the United States, not because I chose to be, it just happened that way. That's where my parents were, where my mother was when I was born. So I was, I guess, in this sense, accidentally born in the United States. Other people are accidentally born wherever they were actually born. So I, my mother had traveled, had she traveled at the time of my birth, I may very well have been born anywhere on the globe for, for you know, for, for that matter, right? So what is the... The, the origin of this word we use, accident. Well, it originates from the late 14th century common era or uh, AD, an occurrence, an incident, event, what comes by chance. So I don't wanna go into too much detail on this. It's, it comes from the online etymology dictionary. I thought it was somewhat interesting, but you know, you go back and it actually goes all the way to the 1200s the sense has had a tendency since Latin to extend from something that happens, an event, to a mishap, an undesirable event. And it comes from this Latin term, Middle English. We keep going on uh, with this. Then, then from the late 15, uh, 15th century, 
as the operations of chance, meaning an unplanned child is attested by 1932. In other words, the baby was an accident. Well, no, I can assure you it wasn't an accident. I think this is where I, you know, how we view the word accident uh, is sort of interesting. And I'll get into that a little bit more, but the term being accident prone actually is from 1926 when that uh, term became somewhat commonplace. Good morning. Oh gosh. And they show it over and over. I love it. Okay. So, so four people are recovering from injuries after um, that collision between an Amtrak train and a semi-truck uh, stopped on the tracks. The local sheriff says the truck got stuck on the tracks because of its weight. The driver and his dogs were able to escape mm -hmm. before that crash. Four of the people on the train, though, were in fact injured. No lives, thankfully, lost. But what an incredibly uh, tragic scene there. And, and thankfully, though, everyone, everyone okay and able to exit that vehicle before the crash actually happened. Mm -hmm. So I got to ask everybody a question. I, and I'm just going to have to replay a short portion of it. Exactly. Why did that train blow its horn? At that point, I have no idea. Clearly, everyone already knew it was there. The train is coming. But that's not an accident. It, it's called an accident, but it is not an accident. The truck was crossing the tracks and got stuck. Somehow, they couldn't stop the train. The train came. The train hit it. Um, it's not, it didn't happen by chance. It happened for a reason. And you could ask a billion questions. Should the driver have realized that, that that could happen? Should they have been going faster as they crossed the track? Should they have crossed the tracks at all based on their weight and the configuration of the vehicle? Should they have known that? You know, these are all, I mean, you, you can go through and, and, and dissect this and get all kinds of information. But this, yeah, okay, that's kind of an accident. So again, good morning, everyone. I, I wanted to make sure everybody had a good good breakfast. He appears quite, he or she, I can't tell, appears quite happy. So uh, very proud of themselves, very good. Do not believe so, that the dragon warrior can stop him. The panda? Master, that panda is not the dragon warrior. He wasn't even meant to be here. It was an accident. There are no accidents. <sighs> yes, I know. You've said that already. Twice. Well, that was no accident either. Thrice. So, Master Ugwe from, from, uh, from uh, 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 Kung Fu Panda, the movie, uh, very good book. There are no accidents. The Deadly Rise of Injury and Disasters, Who Profits and Who Pays the Price by Jesse Singer. Um, interesting book that talks about um, the various industries involved in accidents, the legal industry, of course, how we use accidents to explain away bad behavior and shift responsibility, almost making people that do things that are wrong into victims versus actually being responsible for what actually occurred. And it's a, it's a very, it's an interesting read. I suggest that you uh, take a look at that book. Um, but there's also, of course, the insurance industry. I'm really not sure how to pronounce uh, Beam Dyke, uh, but it's an insurance company, as you could imagine. And safety is no accident. Well, if safety is no accident, then accidents are no accidents either. I mean, there's a, uh, you, you sort of have to look at it that way. But let's get into this uh, first case. Perfusion accidents causes. Well, they can be manufacturing defects. They can be maintenance deficiency. They can be a setup error. They can be attention. They can be impairment. There can be communication failures. There can be communication errors. There can be errors in judgment. It can be an issue of training, knowledge, and basic competence. Um, you can have a team cohesion or lack of cohesion, which 
essentially generates an atmosphere where people are un, uh, unwilling to speak up for fear of retribution or fear of ridicule or whatever it may be. And all of these things that I listed are by no means complete, but all of them have potential to result in an accident, if you will, occurring. Standard of care. Now we're going to get into a little bit more detailed or a little more specific about responsibilities, duty, uh, if you will, of healthcare professionals, in this case, perfusionists. The first thing to know is that standard of care is a legal term, not a medical term. I think most of us knew that. That means it is primarily lawyers, not doctors, who use it. In general, the only times that most doctors talk or think about the standard of care is when they are testifying in court on medical malpractice cases or when they are attending medical malpractice seminars. Different states define it in slightly different ways, but the medical standard of care usually means the degree of care and skill of the average healthcare provider who practices in the provider's specialty, taking into account the medical knowledge that is available in the field. So the standard of care is typically based on the hypothetical practices of a reasonably competent healthcare professional in the same or similar community. Basically, it comes down to you cannot judge one person's actions by the actions of an expert or someone who uh, has uh, 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 someone who has three years of experience to somebody that has 40 years of experience, depending on where that experience was gained. Um, so an academic center, 40 years or 30 years or 20 years is very different than a 20, 30 or 40 year experience in community-based medicine. Um, and uh, what you see are a trauma center versus a non-trauma center. There's a lot of variables that influence what a reasonably competent healthcare professional should know. So case number one is a Utah woman. I've presented this case once before, uh, but I have some additional detailed information about this. A Utah woman bled to death into a garbage can during botched heart surgery, lawsuit says. So Donna Mae Brocknick, 62, died at St. Mark's Hospital in Mill Creek on July 11th, 2018, after undergoing surgery to remove a heart device. No one wants this headline. No one wants to be associated with this headline, but this headline comes directly out of uh, the, uh, a, a published periodical. So what are the facts of this case? Well, the surgery performed was the removal of an ASD closure device and then primary closure of the uh, ASD. The technique was femoral vein fem uh, and right IJ cannulation for drainage because they were gonna go through the right atrium, femoral arterial return, right, arter arter uh, right anterior thoracotomy approach, go on pump, snare the SVC and the IVC, do an atriotomy, remove the device, close the ASD, close the atrium, wean off of CPB, do an echo, confirm everything looks good, give protamine, decannulate, and close. Pretty straightforward, simple operation. However, the patient became very unstable. The diagnosis was severe hypovolemia. Fluid resuscitation was started. The surgeon who had already left the room and was elsewhere was notified. The patient coded. CPR was initiated. 
Massive transfusions were started. The surgeon returned, opened the chest, and found the heart to be completely empty. The disassembled perfusion circuit, since they were closed and the surgeon had left the room and they were decannulated, protamine, etc., was pulled, lifted, the circuit reservoir was lifted from the trash can to find it full of blood, overflowed with blood, and it was realized that the right IJ, right internal jugular line, was still in, unclamped, patent, and drained right back into the reservoir, down the venous line, into the trash can. Ultimately, this patient was declared uh, dead, and a lawsuit was filed, as you could well imagine. Well, what do you think happened next? Yeah, looking for a scapegoat. Who was the scapegoat? Exactly. It was the perfusionist. And when you look at this case, in, and, and at first blush, you, you wonder to yourself, how in the heck, heck could this happen? How? Um, you know, what is, what is our responsibility? You know, I, whose fault is this? This certainly isn't an accident. No one intended for it to happen, but it's still not an accident. And the question is, how do we learn from this? What do we learn from this? So how did this accident happen? Well, team cohesion. The perfusionist was not part of the team. In fact, uh, they were disliked uh, and there were, there were real, real issues. The perfusionist had less than a year of experience as a perfusionist. So when I talk about this chip shot case, yep, got it, know exactly what you're going to do, I'm basing that on having seen it before, having done many of not that particular case, but the same approach. I understand what they're doing, why they're doing it, but I have a lot of years of experience and I've seen it. So you have to ask yourself, was there a manufacturing defect? Remember our list, maintenance deficiency, setup error, attention, impairment, communication failure, communication error, judgment, training, knowledge, competence, team cohesion. Well, there was no team cohesion. So let me take my pen and I'm just gonna scratch that out. No team cohesion. Communication, the surgeon communicated with everyone but the perfusionist about this case because the perfusionist was disliked. And the surgeon in this particular case, who he liked or who he didn't like more, more accurately was disliked by everyone else. They were a clique. Okay, surgeon had yelled at the perfusionist from the beginning because of a cannula mix up, which the surgeon and the surgeon verbalized that the perfusionist did not understand the procedure. The surgeon left the OR once they came off pump with the right IJ line still in the neck, but draped. The surgical field had begun breaking down. The perfusionist broke down the pump and placed disposables in a biohazard, biohazard waste container. In front of everybody was tearing it down. So clearly no one said we're still cannulated. Perfusionist did not fully understand the procedure, was relatively inexperienced and lacked the confidence to truly be aware of the proverbial 30,000 foot view. So did we have a manufacturing defect? No. Was there a maintenance deficiency? No. Was there a setup error? No. Was there an attention issue? Eh, I'm gonna put a check as a possible. Was there impairment? No. Was there a communication failure? Absolutely. Two checks. Communication error? Well, I think they both go hand in hand, but Judgment, you know, uh, you know what, how does that saying go? Our good judgment uh, ex, ex, 
experience judgment comes from experience and our best experience comes from poor judgment something like that i can't remember the phrase exactly but it's it, you get the point so you know there was probably some underlying lack of judgment training knowledge and competency you know she's relatively new less than a year should she have known um, i don't know i think that's a question mark i have to ask so there's a lot in here that makes you wonder what the heck if the surgeon says that they don't think the perfusionist understands the procedure well how about take the time to sit down and explain the procedure because that may have made all the difference in the world in this case there was no team cohesion the perfusionist was disliked and treated as an outcast. And that was wrong. So I, I don't know what to say about that. It's complicated. But those are the facts as I understand them. And by the way, all of these cases are public knowledge so that you know um, you can find these cases on your own um, online. And uh, they're very interesting because you can read everything. All of it is public information. Um, there is no question in my mind that it is so critically important that you have good communication, that everyone is on the same page with what we're doing, that everyone communicates with each other, regardless of your personal feelings about anybody. It doesn't make any difference. It's our responsibility to be uh, good communicators with, uh, with each other in the operating room in particular, because that, that is a difference between, in many cases, uh, life or death. It'll be interesting to see what ultimately happens with this particular case. So that's case number one. Case number two is a 60-year-old male going in for cabbage surgery. During the procedure, there was an open venous reservoir, so a hard shell, and it began developing a layer of foam on the top of it. Over time, this foam layer became larger and larger and larger and upon termination of CPB, after doing the case, large amounts were seen in the aorta and the arterial cannula. In fact, the surgeon noted that the aorta was opacified with air. The patient condition, of course, worsened. The circuit ultimately was changed and CPB was reinitiated. And interestingly enough, no further air was seen in the circuit. So the foam layer, all of that just disappeared upon reinitiating bypass with a new circuit. The patient eventually was weaned from bypass. The patient never woke up and the patient was ultimately declared brain dead and, uh, and died. So what happened? So if we look at this this is the reservoir here and this is what was filling with foam now this isn't the actual procedure pictures i'm just showing you where the foam was let me see if i can make this uh i can't make my pen work for some reason let me try doing that maybe that's what i had to do no i can't figure out how to make the pen work uh david I'm trying. Yeah, I'm trying, but it doesn't work. That's all right. I mean, I don't want to do that. So, oh. um, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. So all of this was filled with foam. If we go down here, we see that we have the venous line in the patient coming out, going through a uh, venous blood sensor. I imagine that's a blood gas analyzer. Uh, there's a regulating clamp, which I don't think most of us use. It's going into the venous reservoir. So this piece that you see here is this piece here. 
okay? Comes out of the Venus Reservoir. This has an air bubble detector sensor, usually not commonly placed there. Goes into the blood pump. In this case, it was a centrifugal pump. Goes out of the centrifugal pump into the heat exchanger oxygenator. Comes out as arterialized blood goes through an arterial line filter, and voila, back to the patient above the clamp in the ascending aorta. You see this line here. This is an arterial line, an arterial filter purge line that goes back into the top of the venous reservoir. And this is going to be very important for uh, this discussion. Sorry about that. Okay. As is this. It's important to note also that Anything on this side is under negative pressure, and anything on this side is positive pressure. So this blood pump that you see right here is the same as this blood pump is right here. So everything from here to here is negative, and from here to here and beyond is under positive pressure. Very important to note that. So how did this happen? Was there a manufacturing defect? Mm, there was, but that's a possibility. There just happens to be in this case. Was there a maintenance deficiency? No, not really. Was there a setup error? Well, that depends on how you view what actually happened. Was there an attention problem? Quite possibly. Was there impairment? No. Was there a communication failure? No. Was there a communication error? No. Was there a lapse in judgment or good judgment? Possibly. Was there an issue with training, knowledge, and competence? Absolutely not. Was there team cohesion? Yes. So the obvious questions are, was this an experienced perfusionist? And I've already answered that. Yes, it was a very experienced perfusionist. Was there an obvious manufacturing defect? No, not obvious, but there was a manufacturing defect. So right here, when they sent uh, this in for uh, review from the manufacturer. As I said before, this area is negative. This area is positive. So the blood comes in this way, goes out this way. Right here, there was a very, very small micro crack in the housing of the pump in that area. See where I'm going with this, I'm assuming. As I'm looking at this case, there's a glaring omission in the lawsuit. So the, I'm going to go back to this picture here. In the lawsuit, the perfusionist is sued, the hospital is sued, the surgeon is sued, anesthesia is sued, the manufacturer of the disposables are sued, but the heart-lung machine manufacturer is not sued. And I'm like, how could that possibly be? Because the reason I say that is, I showed you this right here, air bubble detector sensor. And there should be another one right here, air bubble detector sensor. Now, this says optional position. This says that it should be there, it's not optional. You know, there's a, a, a debate of where it should be but it needs to be somewhere. Either it needs to be here, or it needs to be here, or it needs to be here, or it needs to be here. There's usually only one on any heart-lung machine, but it needs to be somewhere in there. 
They're there for a reason, right? We went through all of this. We went through this. I showed you the crack. Remember, it's right there. Remember, this is the negative side. Negative pressure. This is positive pressure. Is that a spell positive or just one S? I have no idea. So there's this glaring omission. How could this be that the manufacturer of the heart lung machine isn't being sued? How did the air emboli alarm not go off? Well, there are some reasons why it might not. You know, they are generally set for different size bubbles. And what I figured out had occurred here, and I think everybody agrees this is what occurred, is that micro crack, if you look at this diagram here, right here, that micro crack would be right here where I made that red mark. That under negative pressure sucked a constant stream of bubbles came out here went into the oxygenator, overwhelmed the oxygenator, came out this way, into the arterial line filter, was purged back to the top of the oxygenator and filled this full of foam. That's how this area here became full of foam and why, when they went back on bypass, it wasn't there. Again, micro crack right here, sucks air and trains air, small bubbles, goes this way into the oxygenator, comes out of the oxygenator, arterialized. Here you see this is an air bubble sensor right here. This is a flow probe, air bubble sensor right there. Now, if the bubbles are small enough, this might not pick it up, possibly. But if they're, you know, as much air as we're talking about, I'm surprised it didn't go off or it wasn't seen in the arterial line filter with the purge. We have ours as an integrated arterial line filter, so it's a little different design, but does the same exact thing. And there's a purge line off the top of that, which you can see, I'll just circle it right here, this line here. Was it on? Because if it's not on, it's not going to work. There are no accidents, Master Ugwe. There's mistakes. There's misfeasance. There's malfeasance. There's negligence. There's a standard of care. There's a duty. There's harm. There's loss. And sometimes these things are inconsequential and other times they're very consequential. And I'll just tell you um, as we wrap this session up that the reason that the heart lung machine manufacturer was not sued in this case was because the perfusionist did not believe in air bubble detectors and chose not to use one. In fact, has not used one in their professional career. And this is a good guy, good perfusionist, competent. But is that misfeasant? Is it malfeasant? Is it negligent? Does it meet a standard of care that a an average competent perfusionist would follow? Did he fail in his duty? Did he cause harm and a loss? Was this inconsequential? Clearly not. Sometimes it is. Sometimes things happen and you get away with it, you know, and you go like, huh, oh, by the grace of God, go we, you know, and thankfully for the patient, thankfully for you, thankfully for your care for your career. You know, as I said, there are, there are perfusion incidents. Um, I guess you can call them what you want. 
they're not accidents. Nothing happens by accident. And there are near misses. There are things that just happen, um, like an aortic, like a dissection. Um, they had a flap. It wasn't, you know, noted. Uh, no one had done a CTA, and for some reason, this flap dissected and and uh, and and ended up. You had a problem. Uh, a lot of these things. There's a lot of things that happen. That happen through no fault, through no breach of standard of care, through no failure to provide the duty uh, that we have to uh, do no harm, following every possible thing we know. And still things, bad things can happen. But at the end of the day, it happened for a reason. And because of our, you know, very, very litigious society, um, we are disinclined to really openly discuss serious issues that have occurred to us personally in an operating room that, you know, either did or didn't result in patient harm. Um, you go back to the literature and there's really not an abundance of perfusion accident um, uh, data out there uh, because that's not generally something that we want to publish, discuss, or deal with. But at the end of the day, is it not more in the public interest that we be able to do this so that we can create systems or technology uh, or, uh, uh, or, or, or alerts to people to be aware of this could happen so that others learn from your misfortune, if you will, uh, having been the person that had that happen to. But very much our society is not designed for that because you'll be sued and uh, you will be sued and you will be ruined. Now, you know, I think the first case that I discussed, um, that very young perfusionist, of course, you know, pretty much in the same uh, way that David Wood described, that was the last case that they ever did. Was it her fault? Well, yes, it was. Was it solely her fault? No, it wasn't. There's a whole bunch of people that are responsible for what happened in that case in Utah. In this other case that I discussed, um, I can see no other, uh, any, I can't see any other reason you know, had they used, first of all, had that micro crack occur. And I'll tell you what this has caused me to do. What I do now, because I've seen it in our sim lab that we have here. So I know, yeah, you're la my, my, my partner in crime back there is laughing because they know it's true. We were getting air everywhere in our ECMO simulator circuit and couldn't figure it out. And when we clamped the inlet of the centrifugal pump, which we had used over and over and over and over and over. The tubing was weak and old and tired and so forth. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, that's perfect. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, it's a mess over there right now. I don't want people to see the mess. We're going to clean that up um, and set it back up again. But when we clamped it, massive amounts of just a stream of air and this is in water, so blood's gonna act very differently. Um, and so it was very interesting to see. So if I do a case now, I'm concerned enough that I'm clamping the inlet of the centrifugal pump and I'm ramping it up to see if I am entraining air 
through that area because that crack could have occurred in a whole variety of ways. Could have been dropped and cracked it. It was a micro crack. It was, it was not a manufacturing defect. That has been established. Could have occurred with the pump being set up and inadvertently pushing a cart through. It could have been housekeeping, could have been nurses, could have been biomed, could have been anybody. Bump a cart into it hard enough to cause that crack, maybe crack the connector as it moved over. That's very possible as well. And then the next question is, would the air bubble detector have picked it up? Because again, these were teeny little streams of bubbles, but the more resistance you have, negative pressure to, to pulling, the higher your flow, the more that air is going to stream. May not have picked it up, but if you didn't hook it up, you don't know. And that's, that's it. Had that been hooked up, it's very possible to have, you know, but then the question is, where's all this foam coming from? Well, how do you do a whole case and not think to yourself, my reservoir is filling up with foam. How do you not see it coming through your, the top of your arterial line filter? So was the attention being paid? Do we become complacent? You know, I mean, there's just so many questions associated with that second case. The first case is horrifying. I can't imagine being that perfusionist. I can't even imagine having experienced something like that. It's gut-wrenching. And I imagine the second one is too. You know, you've got one person who had this tragic event and everyone pointed their finger at her. Everyone, the scapegoat. Not the case in the second. The second uh, uh, situation was a very well-liked, very experienced person um, and unfortunate. I don't know if they're still practicing or not, to be honest with you. I know the first person is not practicing. The young lady is not practicing. So less than a year as a perfusionist, and that's the end of their career um, over something like that. Um, you know, ultimately, we take the clamps off. We, we, we're the ones, right? A more experienced person, however, would have been, well, where's that IJ cannula? Are you sure you took that out? But if you're afraid to talk, but you can't be afraid to talk. So, so many lessons here that we can learn from these experiences about what is our responsibility. I don't care if you like me or not, you have a line left in that neck and we need to get that out. And why is the surgeon leaving? Why are you leaving? They're, you, you're leaving that IJ line in? The protamine's been given. Who would do that? It was an oversight. And it could have been just the, 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 the mood of the room because this was who the perfusionist was that day. It's really hard for me to say. Um, would I have noticed it? I'd like to think so, but I'm not 100% sure that I would have. So anyway, Hopefully, you know, I've uh, brought up some provocative thoughts. I've brought up a couple of provocative cases. And, uh, you know, we can all maybe continue this discussion with, is there a way for perfusionists to report incidents that occur anonymously without having to fear uh, being, you know, suffering the wrath um, and learn from whatever mishaps occur. And then on the other hand, if things do occur, is that really fair if there's a, a victim? Because it's not an accident. There's somebody that got harmed. Accidents aren't, har people don't get harmed if you think about it like the baby uh, in the morning. So what's our responsibility to let the family members or the patients know what happened. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? But if you do, it could be the end of your career. You could be ruined uh, professionally and financially. And is that right? It's a, it's a complex system, a complex problem. I really don't have good answers. I just have a lot of questions about it. 
and hopefully there's somebody out there that's watching this that will email me and say, I wanna be part of this discussion and let's listen to your input and your perspective as many people as would like to so we can maybe all learn from this and figure out what we're gonna do in the future. Okay, we have, we're gonna start back again uh, in 10 minutes. We're gonna take a quick 10 minute break I do. We're going to take a quick five minute break by mistake. Thank you. Five minute break. And we're going to come back with a video, a couple of slides, and then a discussion with Justin Kendrick, uh, senior vice president and CEO, Memorial Hermann, the Woodlands Hospital, and some other places. You'll get an opportunity to meet him and listen to his perspective, his thoughts on the uh, two uh, most pressing challenges that he experienced through the COVID pandemic in his role as a hospital administrator. I think it's going to be very enlightening and elucidating. Thank you. I'll see you in five minutes.
My name is Michelle. I'm a Zumba instructor. And teaching Zumba is, was the funnest time of my life. Um, I've always loved dance, always. I was getting ready to start a podcast on YouTube and then COVID happened. And um, around about March, I started feeling a little sick. I went to the ICU. And from there, um, I developed pneumonia and um, they thought I needed a lung transplant. So I was put in a medically induced coma for the summer. From May, June, July, I don't remember any of it. I know I was extremely sick. When I woke up, I uh, couldn't walk. I couldn't walk, I couldn't talk. I couldn't remember my phone number. I couldn't remember my password to my cell phone to call them. The staff there put me in a body cast and I still had life support hooked to my neck. Still had the trach in my throat. And uh, I remember taking, walking about 110 feet that day, the same day. It took the staff about 10 people to get me up out of the bed and to start walking. So I remember my husband coming in and talking to me, but I wasn't able to respond. I was not able to see my daughter and my husband until I had been awake for about five weeks. My daughter had grown so tall. I was just happy that uh, my husband was able to maintain as best as possible by himself. Um, I was really proud of him, really proud of him proud of my daughter. Um, she drew me a picture. And I remember uh, being able that day to take my first steps without the walker. Michelle's recovery was longer than any other patient that we've had in this hospital with COVID. She had symptom onset around April 18th, which by my calculations, was um, 123 days um, from when she started feeling ill with shortness of breath and some GI complaints to the day that she left our hospital. When I remember coming downstairs and seeing all of the people and I remember thinking, these are the best people in the world. They were kind to me and my family and it, it is still resonating with me right now, to this day. Initially, when the vaccine became available, I had my reservations about it because it was so new and I was so uneducated about COVID, the disease itself, that I wasn't sure if getting the vaccine would stop such a deadly disease. I was a pretty healthy person. I've never had any surgeries. I've never been in the hospital before. I've never had the flu before, but I was always, I was never against it. I just did not understand or trust that it could completely keep you from getting COVID. So I was actually waiting for it to become available. Uh, or, you know, when I contract COVID. Before leaving the hospital, I was stoked about going home, of course, but I decided to get the vaccine because I thought to myself, there is absolutely no way that I am leaving the safety of this hospital without being vaccinated. Is it over? I remember feeling like I had just voted. Um, I don't know, but whenever we vote for a new president of the United States, I always feel like I've done my like due diligence as a as a human being. But I remember thinking doing this for my family, my friends, and everybody else. Do not deprive yourself of that um, shot. It's very, very important. Uh, I will go as far as to say your life depends on it. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like... Okay, and My welcome thing. everyone to part two of today's series. I wanted to show you this slide very quickly before we bring our guest in, our honored guest in. 
Uh, this is U.S. Mort mortality. This is from the CDC. Death certificates listing pneumonia, influenza, and COVID-19. And you see uh, that first spike there in 2018 for green, the influenza deaths, followed by a small spike in 2019. And uh, let's look at the percentages there, 10.9% of all death certificates in the United States were deaths due to pneumonia or influenza in 2019, 7.7% .7 and in uh, 2020, I'm sorry, could you go uh, to the end of that slide again? Forgive me. It was, oh, it's a video, I'm so sorry. So it was around 27%. I wanna make sure that I get that number right for us here today. Uh, so just bear with me one second. And uh, again, in orange, uh, it's the number of deaths due to pneumonia, influenza, or COVID-19. So it's all combined. Although our experience was, and there's that spike that you see there uh, in the uh, 2020 period. And uh, earliest COVID death certificate was just at the beginning of 2020, 7.7% there you see. and. 7.6 for the winter of 2019 into 2020, 27.5%. And then uh, it dropped off week ending. So next slide. Uh, this shows the TMC data. And if you look at 2020, uh, you see here, uh, 2020, this first spike, this was the original strain and then you come over here and you have 2021, and this is both intermixed with original strain and the, Wuhan, uh, the uh, Delta variant. And if you look here, you see that it says very cold because this was the freeze we had as well in uh, the winter of 2021. And then later on, we had perhaps some Delta and Omicron, and then it's going out, and we all know kind of the, the pathway that this virus has taken, both in its uh, decreased virulence, increased transmissibility, and all of these things that are going on right now. Okay, next slide, please. Here is Interstate 45 at Rayford Sawdust. Uh, I was actually on this road, and this is Houston, Texas, and this was during the time that the COVID pandemic was reaching, for us, its height of patience. So next slide, please. And I want to introduce, please, our, uh, our guest, Justin Kendrick, Senior Vice President and CEO, Memorial Hermann the Woodlands Medical Center and Memorial Hermann Northeast Hospital. Justin uh, has served as the Senior Vice President and CEO of Memorial Hermann the Woodlands Medical Center and Memorial Hermann Northeast during his nine year tenure. Now I met Justin when he was uh, relatively new uh, to here to the Memorial System here in Houston. I didn't realize I've known him this long, but I, I have um, and uh, uh, he's the director of operations at Memorial Hermann Sugarland Hospital as well. That's a lot of territory to cover between Sugarland and Memorial Hermann, the Woodlands uh, Medical Center. We're talking about a uh, an 80 mile uh, probably trek, 70 mile minimum. He is the former COO of Texoma Medical Center in Denison, Texas, and prior to that role. He served as an associate administrator of Palmdale Regional Medical Center in Palmdale, California. I love Palmdale, California. I was out that way. I was at Riverside County. Justin received his bachelor's degree in business administration from Southern Nazarene University and master's degree in healthcare administration from Trinity University in San Antonio. He's a, he's a member of the American College of Healthcare Executives and serves on numerous community service and development boards. He's a resident of uh, the Woodlands and he's married to his wife, uh, Chelsea, and they have three children, two daughters and a son, Collins, Ellison and Brooks. And let's meet Justin Kendrick. Justin, it is so nice to see you. I cannot thank you enough 
for taking time from what is an incredibly busy schedule to be here with us today and to do this for us. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my privilege, Joe. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So I've introduced you, but I have to ask you if I can, because I think that, uh, you know, a lot of people, especially younger folks who we probably have a fairly young audience, um, uh, I would imagine, and they talk about the administrators and they really don't understand or know uh, that you're just people. And I don't know if you saw your introduction at, uh, at that slide. I wrote a note up at the top of it that said ordinary people did extraordinary things. Mm -hmm. And we're both pretty ordinary people when you get right down to it. So I'd like to take that maybe mystique away from the younger generation of my colleagues to recognize that you're there for a purpose and uh, how can they be a part of the process, the conversations, and uh, the future of our profession and helping you. But before we get into that, tell us something about yourself that we don't know from your bio. And I know something, so I may share it depending on what you decide to do. Mm, that's interesting. Um, but yeah, we have known each other for quite some time now. And uh, again, it's my privilege to be able to connect with you and uh, connect with this uh, sector of our profession of the healthcare industry and such. Uh, I think the biggest thing that's not on there is uh, my family uh, dynamic. You talk about uh, ordinary people. I actually see behind me, I've got a picture of my wife uh, back there, been married for 15 years now. Um, creates a great amount of balance in my life and, and which is something that I think that we've all needed uh, over these past two years. Uh, I've got three kids, both um, 10, eight and six. And so we're, uh, very, we're very busy individuals with uh, soccer and cheer and um, all sorts of different activities, uh, baseball and, and things like that. So, you know, your comment about ordinary people doing extraordinary things uh, struck a chord. And, and I think that's what has been demonstrated over these past two years that we're all a bunch of ordinary people in positions uh, coming forth to do amazing things. And, you know, part of my job is to support and empower individuals like yourself and all of our other individuals uh, on our care teams and everyone else who supports the care teams and such. And uh, so that's an honor and privilege uh, that I hold um, within these positions that I hold up here at the Woodlands and Northeast. And I'm looking forward to further conversation with you. And I have absolutely no idea what you're going to share after that. Very good. Well, I'll, I'll share it. You do like cruises. Yeah, I like cruises. Yes. Yes. You I, like yeah, cruises. I was, yeah, I was. In fact, I was on the uh, the last Disney cruise with the family um, on that was represented on that graph when the world shut down in March. Uh, back yes, in 2020. I remember that. Yes. I remember <laughs> because that's actually my first question to you has to do with that period of time. So you had uh, uh, previously been with More Harm of the Woodlands and then you uh, as COO, and then you moved down to the medical center, uh, where you were, uh, one of the, you were, a, uh, was it, uh, I was the COO of the med center. COO yeah, of the med center. The COO Please of the forgive med me for center. that. But I remember you were planning this trip and we were, uh, in your office and we were kind of joking with each other about how are we going to identify these patients? Uh, with coronavirus, are we going to hang a lime outside of their door, you know, and we, we sort of had a little chuckle about that. And I know that I miscalculated horribly just how bad this was actually going to become. And my question is, well, one, did, do you, do you, do you feel the same way I do about myself? As I said, I feel like I miscalculated. Uh, how to the degree this was going to severity of the degree of severity. But why do you think so many, including me, actually didn't predict how overwhelming this was going to come in such a short period of time? Yeah, I would certainly have to throw myself into that camp uh, as well. And 
you know, try to give myself a little bit of grace uh, along the way. You know, being downtown at our medical center campus, you know, we had uh, various physician leaders who had contacts in other parts of the world. Uh, other colleagues of theirs that they knew, um, individuals in Italy and China. You know, if you recall back two and a half years ago now, uh, there was uh, all of the, the hospitals in Italy that were completely overrun. And, and that's where we started learning some of these types of things. And and I, again, I, yeah, I'm probably too hard on myself, um, but I think that, uh, you know, I've never experienced anything close to this in my life. And, and you would say that you've never experienced anything like this in your life. And maybe there's this um, element that even if we see this happening in other parts of the world, is it really gonna be coming this direction and traveling across the world so far? Uh, before we're able to get some uh, control measures in place or some treatment options in place. Um, and to be honest, that cruise uh, that I mentioned, you know, our infectious disease specialist, uh, he told me after I came back that he was really worried about me. Um, but at that point in time, I, again, go back to being an ordinary human being. I can remember sitting in the room uh, on the Thursday before we uh, flew out that Thursday night to go on the spring break trip with the family and you know, we're contemplating shutting down travel for uh, for all employees and, and things like that with what we were seeing coming uh, from other areas of the country. And my first thought, and again, I just think that this makes me a real human being, was there's no way that I can go home and tell my kids that we can't go on this Disney cruise that we've been planning on for so long. So we tried to take the measures that we could. Uh, we tried to get you know, our own car or rented our own car and, and not take the public transportation. And we reviewed our seats on the airplane and got ourselves like as far away from other people as we possibly could and, and uh, did all those types of things. But it was, that, it was the first time really that I've taken a computer with me on a family trip like this, just unbeknownst what's gonna happen. Am I gonna get stuck on a ship and you know, but I don't think I could have ever recalled or ever had any idea what the next two and a half years uh, would have. I do, I was on that ship Wednesday night was when Disney shut down, it came overhead, everything was changing. Uh, and then I really started getting a feel for how the li how life was going to be changing on that Sunday night when we got back into town and you know found myself on a 10 o'clock conference call with uh, a lot of our surgeons that were on our uh, surgery executive leadership team and uh, just one foot in front of the other started figuring out that uh, this was going to be unlike anything any of us had ever seen. Absolutely. So I think for perspective, uh, which may help a little bit, uh, because there was a time when yours as well as others in the woodlands, the, the uh, critical care units had overflow and every bed in the unit was COVID associated or every patient COVID associated ARDS. And what was fascinating about that to me was what is, because we shut down, if you recall, we weren't doing heart surgery, you weren't doing hernia surgery, you weren't doing uh, 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 colorectal surgery, we were doing lung surgery, you were doing, we were doing nothing anywhere. Well, those patients still existed. And at first, the, the hospital just filled up with patients, all of them with a COVID diagnosis, and there was a mad scramble. And I, you know, there's been a study that was done in England, I'm waiting for the data to come here to the United States, I think it's inevitable, where the non-COVID associated uh, mortality quadrupled in the UK during the COVID pandemic. And I found that to be fascinating. Yeah, uh, you know, my reaction to that is, uh, you know, there's a lot of flashbacks happening right now. I see the graph, you know, you make your, your comments and such. And I think, you know, being in my position also, so I, when the pandemic started, I was still the COO downtown at our TMC campus. And then I came up into this, uh, into my current position 
in July. And so we had already gone through the dynamics of the world shutting down so much while I was downtown. And then this to come is July up, 2020. Of 2020, right. And then to come up into the position that I'm in now and, you know, over Northeast and, and uh, both Northeast and the Woodlands campuses, this was a very real dialogue in, in many different settings uh, that we are trying to figure out what's the best way because life still goes on and these other disease states still go on uh, and they still need attention. And I think that we all tried to evolve and pivot as best as possible uh, in order to how to treat them past that first blip that you saw on the graph there in, in March and April time period and such. But it was still very unknown territory. There was still, I've never seen anything in my life where people put their own mortality into the conversation. Mm -hmm. And that's an element that's not necessarily understood by anyone else outside of our industry. Mm -hmm. uh, but we really kind of, I mean, I look at upon myself in, in any of the conversations that I was having in order to try to strike balance. And I think that's a word that I oftentimes uh, go to in many different settings. How do we take a balanced approach to caring for uh, those patients that are a part of this pandemic, but then also not taking our eye off the ball on all of these other individuals? And then how do we also keep our eye on a lot of the care members of these teams, perfusionists, you know, critical care physicians, to other surgeons, to nursing staff and, and everybody? And it's there was just such strong feelings coming from so many different angles. Uh, you know, politics started playing a role into it. And, and, you know, Houston's very diverse and has very different feelings across the board as well. Uh, but that's where I felt as though we tried to get through with every single wave, learn from uh, what happened or what our game plan was with each surge and evolve a little bit continuous, uh, continually moving forward. Well, I think you'll find this interesting. And those are very good points, Justin. And I, I appreciate so much uh, the, uh, the, the humanistic way that you are presenting uh, what you experienced, you know, as an administrator, where your responsibility is to the, of course, healthcare providers, to the patients, to the community at large. Um, so, you know, clinicians have sort of an easier, I think, approach to this in that we have one thing that we do. I'm a perfusionist. Um, a heart surgeon has, you know, is a heart surgeon. Now they may do legs and things like that, but it, we have a, we have a, a group of patients. You have an entire hospital with multiple different disciplines, multiple different surgeons with particular needs, community that is looking to you for accepting their patient for whatever their problem may be. And when you're overwhelmed and you're having to, as a hospital, make a decision like that as an administrator, that is not something that I, I don't think they teach that in your education platform that you use for healthcare administration. And maybe that, I, I don't know if they do or not. I, I can't imagine they do, but if they don't, um, they probably should. But in 2018, uh, Memorial Hermann, the Woodlands Hospital did three VV ECMOs lasting between four days and two weeks. In 2019, eight VV ECMOs lasting about the same duration. During the pandemic period, 38, that is a 4H or 32, 500, almost 500% increase, a five-fold increase. And the duration, as we saw from the video of Miss Tate, two and a half months of being on ECMO. There was a time at your hospital, we had six ECMOs going simultaneously. And this is a facility that prior to that, so welcome back, welcome back to the Woodlands, 
because that was that time frame when you first got back from your cruise. Um, you went from four to eight to 38, and the, and the 38 was in a much more compressed time period, higher acuity, and much longer duration. It was amazing at what your facility was able to do. And to that end, can you tell us during that period of time, sort of laying the foundation of what you went through, what were the top two biggest challenges that you faced as an administrator during the COVID crisis at whatever point, whether it be the beginning, the entirety, or the peak? Mm, there's a lot to unpack in what you just said, right? I mean, you talked about uh, the balance between the economic impacts as well as the quality of care and such. Um, you know, we've we've talked about that. You know, what does what do sustainable models look like moving forward? You know, you talk about the balance uh, that that was just forced into the conversation in so many different ways. It wasn't just outside of healthcare. Everybody thought, you know, healthcare was sitting fat and happy during COVID, um, but the economic reality for uh, for various individual surgeons and those that you know, were a part of elective practices and such was. I can tell, I can assure you very top of mind for a lot of different individuals. Um, so that was, uh, you know, that was something that don't feel as though I never really had to uh, engage with so much uh, when you're talking about, okay, well, the, the rules that we are playing out, these individuals will be okay fi financially and won't have to worry about providing th for their families, but these individuals, on the other hand, uh, we're taking away their ability to really earn a living and such. Um, same thing goes with, you know, uh, along the economic impact is that you know, we're the second largest employer. The Woodlands Hospital is the second largest employer within Montgomery County, really second only to Conroe Independent School District. Uh, with that uh, comes a lot of responsibilities and obligations that we take extremely seriously, uh, and that is giving back to the community and in the funding of a lot of different not-for-profits and such. And never uh, did I think that when I came into the CEO role that I would be in the business of, out of public safety, uh, stopping a lot of community activities, galas, things like that, that could be super spreaders. And I felt like I had to do everything that, uh, that I could in order to protect our, our society, but protect our team also. Uh, from because there's only a limited number of individuals who can still care for those folks should they come down with COVID. And, and so I kind of would uh, uh, joke with myself, again, I never thought I'd be in the business of just shutting down community events and such. But, um, you know, I, I go back to the, the top two things, you know, really the first thing is always about our people. It's, it's always about the individuals, uh, no matter whether at times of crisis or, or not. Uh, but specifically in times of crisis, um, caring for our folks as much as we possibly could. And still to this day, it's the same, it's the same answer that I, would, uh, that I would give people what's top of my mind uh, in these, no matter if we're out of the pandemic or, or back in a pandemic and such. Um, you know, that looks and feels per perhaps a lot different to people now than it did two and a half years ago. And it certainly felt a lot different to people during the pandemic. Um, you know, there's the emotional well-being, there's the financial well-being. Um, you know, we've seen what's happened with the economy and such, and now that we pull out of the pandemic, we see a lot of more economic pressures on people. And so how can we continue to uh, keep this wonderful organization pressing forward that provides so much opportunities for people? But, you know, any, any response I could give you, Joe, you say the top two things, um, but it's always going to it's always going to start and end with people, um, and you know we've made incredible investments uh, in in various ways. You know from protecting people financially by guaranteeing income uh, for periods of time to metamorphosing what that support looks like by hiring our own counselors. Um, you know, we have an amazing human being that is outside of. Uh, any benefit structure or things like that that we have on full time for our two campuses, uh, taking care of people uh, where they most need it. 
Uh, all of our benefits from the mental health standpoint have evolved. Um, other benefits, just helping out with daily, you know, with daily life tasks with kids or with dry cleaning or whatever it is, have, have evolved and such. But literally, the I mean, the the top thing would be would be figuring out how to take care of our people so that they can continue to uh, take care of our communities. Well, you know, being that I I go to multiple hospitals, uh, I will tell you that um, I have always been impressed uh, and very rightfully so impressed with that commitment that you you just mentioned uh, because what one of the things that I saw much more of elsewhere than I saw uh, at the uh, Memorial Hermann the Woodlands campus was many, many nurses in an already nursing shortage uh, situation that were being attracted by recruiters to make all this big money traveling to other areas of the country where there was need, which would fill that need and it would however then leave a void where we were mm -hmm. yeah i think you know when i say taking care of our people it starts with taking care of our leaders because our leaders are then with our uh with our uh, various other team members whether or not it's a nurse to um to a, a nurse aide um, to a phlebotomist uh to a pharmacist it, do, it doesn't matter like any of our team members we have to take care of our leaders so and and do it in the way and the spirit in which they can take care of their team members uh also and so yes i you know you mentioned that you didn't see as much of that with the woodlands we fared a lot better comparatively speaking to many other hospitals uh where we didn't lose as many people uh, it still felt like a lot because we had never lost that many people, but we're actually seeing people come back now. You know, we took the we took the stance very early on, which was somewhat different than other facilities around us. Uh, that you know we were gonna we were gonna give them a hug on their way out and tell them that we were gonna leave the light on for them, and that when they were ready to return back, you know that there would be a home back here for them, and uh, just showing that value in individuals. Uh, I think has always made the difference and made a difference in this situation too. I mean, how can I fault somebody for uh, having a situation where, I mean, the last person that I talked to, they were taking one last contract and they were coming back to us and they've already come back to us and, and restarted up with us. It was there, it was that person's opportunity to pay off the last of their school bills. And again, why am I going to say, no, you, you shouldn't go do that. Uh, but I can say, well, thanks for being open and transparent with me and uh, we'll leave the light on for you and, and come back. So, yes, our, our turnover numbers were a lot, um, uh, did not fluctuate as high as, as other campuses and such. And again, I think it speaks to the culture uh, that is so important to me and uh, so important to the leaders and has been uh, such a foundational element of our success in the past. Well, that that's very interesting and uh again you know my my compliments to you for this but i i maybe feel a little bit differently uh i think you know that the private uh, just leave them both up if you don't mind the private things the private companies uh that were pulling these nurses out and using them in other areas where, I mean, clearly there was need, um, but it, all it did was shifted where the need was at any given moment. And I'm not sure it was uh, the right thing to do. You were, you were, I think because of the type of place you are, the type of people that you are, and my compliments, uh, of course, you know, I mean, I was, I'm so humbled by your CNO, Catherine, uh, Janice, uh, Deandra, 
um, you know, everybody on your team and what they were able to do through this. And it's important to note to everybody that, you know, we talked about how we pulled back services, but it's important to note that we eventually ramped back up and that added a greater degree of complexity than we'll be even discussed. I feel a little differently, I think, than you do about leaving, uh, although it's attractive, the money is attractive, um, and uh, there's opportunity to pay off student loans or buy something that you want or just make money and put it in the bank. And certainly I do understand that, but I feel two things. One, you have to have a commitment to your home, the place that has provided uh, a, a sanctuary and uh, 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 employment and uh, a good life to you. So I have some misgivings about people that did leave um, and maybe I'm not as gracious as you are about uh, welcoming them back. Uh, so, you know, I, like I said, I, I'm, I'm a very, I'm a big believer in loyalty. Loyalty is my honor. And I wanted to ask you about your folded flag back there with that plaque, because the first time I've noticed it uh, was today. And I want to know more about that because that's important to me. So, you know, fidelity and, and, and uh, being uh, uh, staying where you are makes sense. I think that the health industry would have been better served for the overall community and the patients if there would have been some type of centralization of moving resources around to spikes and need and being able to shift them uh, to best serve uh, the patients that we were dealing with. Um, so, you know, I, I see it both ways. I understand your perspective. I'm not sure that I quite feel 100% the same way. I have some misgivings and some bad feelings about people that left. Yeah, no, I can, I can, uh, I don't necessarily disagree uh, with what you're saying. I think that, you know, the life that I uh, lead and my responsibilities, I focus on controlling what I can control. And, you know, there were various, uh, you know, as right out of the gate, I think that the, it, it just got out of control. Um, and there was, you know, various initiatives through various uh, public agencies or, or groups like Texas Hospital Association or American Hospital Association that tried to provide some um, some guardrails around this space. But it was very evident to me pretty early on that not, I mean, I, I can certainly advocate and have, uh, along with the other Memorial Hermann CEOs and, and us as a system and such, around putting more guardrails. But at the end of the day, I'm faced with the daily challenges of staffing um, the hospital to take care of those patients that are entrusting us uh, with their care. And so I could have looked at it, you know, one of two ways. Um, I think that the, the, I've gone through the process of being a little bitter uh, at first. And yes, you know, my own self um, has a lot of loyalty. I mean, I started my career with Memorial Hermann, um, left, but came back to Memorial Hermann and, and have always felt very valued. And, and that, um, that is what I try to instill here within this culture. Uh, but I, I also recognize I've not walked a day in other people's shoes either. And, and so I've got to leave myself open to control what I can control and that's where it was, I said, then we just got to double down on our culture element and keep what we can keep and um, keep the connections with those that have left us. Um, you know, and, and there's also two different kinds of individuals. There's individuals who leave and, you know, set the place on fire on their way, on their way out. <laughs> and then there's individuals that come to the office and are crying profusely uh, and very emotional over, over, the fact that they are leaving. And I'll tell you that that second person was far more the majority uh, of those individuals that I'm referring to that, mm -hmm. um, you know, their life situations, this was an opportunity for them to, to resolve and to change. 
Uh, and the fact of them knowing that they could have a place to come back to uh, just kind of sealed the deal, pushed them over the edge. And again, I, I mentioned what I mentioned because I'm a bounce back to Memorial Hermann. You know, I left, uh, was gone for six years with another organization, and yet the door was still open for me, you know, to come back home also. But well, I don't know if you know all, or not, but I'm never, I'm never leaving. You can't get rid of me. Okay, I'm staying <laughs> forever. So we're going to, we're, we're going to, we're going to shift gears. Do you like, you know, I'm right outside. I don't know if you noticed or not. Our, our, my I noticed. That's a lovely right picture. Outside. Yeah. The new, it, yeah. In your the new South line. Tower. Absolutely. Um, so let me ask you this. Uh, when it comes to perfusion services, which encompasses ECMO, I know we've done some, a lot of discussion and I think moving forward with redoing, I think we have to learn from this pandemic. I think we have to learn from this, we'll just call it crisis, uh, because it just happened so fast. It was so incredibly intense in such a compressed period of time. I think that's what made it so challenging for all of us. But through those challenges, through all of the stress, um, I know you, you know, I have to say, I've known you a long time, I mean, surprisingly, but this has aged me. This has <laughs> truly aged me. I mean, I'm younger than you, and look at me. I look dreadful, <laughs> um, comparatively. So you've done very well. Um, it's probably your kindness, but we have to learn from this, and we have to anticipate. We may never see it in our in our professional careers. You may be so. I probably won't see anything like this again. But other people will, and potentially including yourself. What can we learn from this, and how can we be prepared should this occur again, or something similar where we have to ramp up high acuity for an infectious disease with high resource utilization. Is there, are there discussions going on to, at the higher, at really the high levels that you're involved in that are going to address where we could have done much better? I don't want to say failed because I don't think anybody failed anything here, but, how, but we could do better. Yeah, I think those conversations are constantly happening and constantly evolving. I mean, they were topics of conversation with me, uh, with other system leaders last week to uh, this morning. Uh, you know, I think we've gotten a lot better in understanding, one, like where to get information from uh, to help make decisions, how to continue to evolve uh, uh, as the data continues to evolve, uh, what I have, what I've liked is that just to try to streamline decision making, you know, our system has gone very much to a matrix, uh, 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 matrix grid where we look at like low, medium, and high risk, uh, and you know starts looking at data such as community spread, um, wastewater treatment, viral loads in wastewater, and then based upon there starts determining what our activities and what our guidance needs to look like, everything from masking to, uh, to pre-admission testing to different things like that. So I think that we've gotten much more streamlined as to how quickly we make decisions and respond. Now, I will also add that that, that is a constant evolution as far as when a disease state gets to uh, look more, uh, more similar to other disease states and such. And again, there's always going to be varying degrees of opinions. Uh, but back to some of the other elements of the conversation, you know, earlier in this hour, um, how do we continue to acknowledge and care for all disease states uh, simultaneously to going through a pandemic or a crisis or, or whatever word we want to use? Um, so that's where that's where I focus a lot of my time is engaging and listening, uh, listening to other physicians, listening to individuals within the community, um, processing my own thoughts and trying to advocate, um, you know, on behalf of these two facilities and, and this region and such uh, in with our system. 
so that we can continue to try to evolve as appropriately as we possibly can. All while knowing that nobody's going to ever agree. Uh, not everybody's always going to agree upon certain decisions. And, um, and I think we all understand that now and we have to be okay with it. The other element that I try to push, uh, push into conversations also is that uh, you, you have to keep in mind that these are really good people um, before the pandemic, after the pandemic. Uh, and they're making decisions that they believe are in the best interest. And I can assure you that they are giving them a lot of thought. Um, so let's always keep that in mind, um, that there's no hidden agendas, there's no anything like that. Um, but I do appreciate the way that we have gotten a lot more streamlined so that should we have something come again in, uh, in our lifetimes that I believe that we're going to be able to strike that balance a little bit better out of the gate, um, respond in more nimble fashions uh, to when data is evolving, uh, as well as go back and go back to the thing that I mentioned around taking care of our people. I think that we've uh, learned different ways and what's meaningful. That's been a word that I've used uh, a lot is do let's make sure that whatever we do is meaningful to people. That's very interesting. So, you know, I know you're doing a lot of building. Uh, Memorial Hermans added new wings. Your facility is growing exponentially, which is fantastic. Uh, but I view, and I think the public would benefit from also understanding this, I view hospital capacity because every hospital has at some point a fixed capacity. Uh, it can only go so, you only have so many beds and so many people to care for people in those beds. It's kind of like a highway. It's inadequate for the number of people you have in your community. So you add some lanes, you shut the traffic down. There's horrible traffic for four, two, three, four years while they build this expansion and add these lanes. And it's only good for about two days because in the time it took you to build all of that, your community has grown even more. And now the extra lanes are ineffective or inefficient for what your population has grown to. And so instead of building one extra lane, you really needed three extra lanes or four extra lanes. And so I think hospitals are a lot the same way. As you grow your capacity, you increase capacity, you will increase the number of patients that are filling that capacity. And there's just no way to ever be able to, you can't build something that has a uh, uh, 500 empty beds and just leave it there just in case it's financially impossible to do or it's not impossible but it's poor decision financially and uh does it just doesn't make sense but every time you build something you find out within a very short order oh, we probably needed another five beds ten beds or whatever it is you never have enough space either as a hospital or a highway so that's my problem. yeah you know we've tried to get out in front of that a little bit totally understand you know where you're coming from i mean in, in my career most expansion projects that we've done have we've really only opened up about 12 beds at a time you know a, a unit might be 36 and so maybe over a two-year period or one and a half year period you finally get to filling up those 36 beds you know this this uh this region that we're at um has continued uh to attract uh individuals from all over the, the country and the world and, and based upon the industries that we have uh uh driving a lot of the business um development and such in these in this area so our south tower that's behind you uh we this this tower really represents the ability for us to continue to expand with the region in a little bit more of a responsive way so Initially, right out of the gate, we've uh, we planned to have open a, an incremental 60 beds between when we first opened up May 31st and, and really by the end of this calendar year. That's inclusive of some uh, observation level beds, also some critical care beds and such. And, and so right now we've got 27 of those 60 opened and they're full. Uh, but again, I go back to what I said before of I've never really opened up 12 beds, more than 12 beds at a time with any expansion project. So here we've got 60 
And then we do have an additional about 100 beds uh, left that we can open up. Plus, you got to think through all the procedural areas and all of those to support uh, that growth as well. Again, this, this market's unlike a lot of other markets, though, and we should all be as fortunate that these are the good problems that we are talking about Very rather true. than the opposite rather than the opposite. And so when you start looking at uh, an investment of this size and scale, uh, I mean, there just hasn't been, you know, our system hasn't really put in an investment of this size or scale in any other region outside of the medical center in, in years. And so mm -hmm. we're, we're fortunate for the trust that they put into us. Uh, and we're fortunate for the trust that all of our providers and the community put in that we are having these difficult problems, problems nonetheless. Uh, but we're going to try to do what we can to get out in front of it a little bit differently um, than, than how we have in the past. Well, that's a great segue into maybe you telling my colleagues that are watching this program, I'm trying to put my hand in front of your face there, sorry about that, that the, the, the beauty of green screen, I need to use this hand more to talk with. I have to have a hand to talk with. So somebody should have told me that already. Um, but uh, <laughs> poor David over there is like, really? So <laughs> we got to get you into the studio one day. I think you would really enjoy it. It's a, it's, we have some fun yeah. over here. Uh, but uh, maybe tell my colleagues that one, the Woodlands is a wonderful place to live and raise your family or even just retire to. And that working uh, with my company, HET, you can't think of any other place that you would you would want a perfusionist to practice uh, besides <laughs> here with us and uh, and your facility. So I wanted to ask you when you're deciding on service providers, because that is something that is in your that's a, a, a challenge, because when they're not in house and you're using service providers, uh, I'm sure there's some significant challenges associated with that. There's challenges with having in house as well. Um, and of course, you know, as I said, I'm a perfusionist and most of our audience are perfusionists. What characteristics do you look for that you want in your provider, whether it be perfusion or any other industry and what things are deal breakers for you as a decision maker in who comes in to your hospital? Mm, okay. Pretty forthright, uh, integrity, intensity, and intelligence, and those in that order. Um, you know, in, integrity. Uh, if if we can't trust each other, um, then there's there's really no sense in having any relationship. And from an integrity standpoint, I do a lot of listening to folks. Also, uh, you know, who are the stakeholders? Um, who who have they worked with in the past? um how open to the you know how open are they to uh and what do they talk about oh, how open to the are they around certain initiatives but then what what comes out of their mouth also what are their primary uh discussion points is it always financials or is or is it quality outcomes is it strategic direction about what the future holds uh, or is it back to financials? Um, I, I think there's, you know, and then when I would say in, intensity, globally speaking, there also, you know, if you're a, if you're a, you're a hard worker, you've demonstrated uh, hard work, you know, I'll take that over intelligence any day of the, any day of the week. You got to have some intelligence and you have to be very proficient and such, but give me an, give me individuals that are in it for the right reasons over that you know one rock star and i'll take that team uh, every single day so those are the primary you know that's that, I mean, that's widespread from perfusion to housekeeping services to uh, anything that we potentially outsource but i also look at it as far as what's the engagement with other nonprofits without out in the community when we are looking to partner up uh you know are are we mutually aligned individuals in that space as well it's always going to be incredibly important to me that's how, that's incredible i have a question for you you know what i wrote that down the three eyes integrity intensity intelligence um that that was put i'll check, very I'll check that up joe i'll check uh, that needs to be accredited to uh, alan miller he's the 
uh, I guess former chairman. He was the founder of Universal Health Services. They were the organization that I worked for uh, in between my, you know, my uh, when I left Memorial. Yeah, when I left Memorial Hermann. But that was something that uh, was told to me in an interview. And he wrote a book, and and it's and, and it's in the book uh, as well. But it's just always stuck out to me to make sure that I look at individuals, situations, companies in that order. Well, I'm going to make sure I, you know what, that's, that's, I, I really like it. It's concise and uh, it, there's a lot in there that says a lot. The three words says about, uh, you know, two pages of a book in three words, mm -hmm. uh, where maybe even more, maybe a whole chapter. So that's an interesting. Okay. So before I let you go, I need to ask you what about the folded flag and the plaque? So um, you know, mm -hmm. you know, I have, uh, uh, I'm a, I'm a veteran from many years ago. Um, but I noticed things like that and I would like to know what that signifies. Yeah, the, I've got two folded flags, uh, one here and, and one at my house also, uh, that folded flag was just presented to us. Um, the, uh, that was just in May. Uh, it was the flag that was flown over the U.S. Capitol that was reserved for us by uh, Congressman Kevin Brady. Wow. Uh, and it, and uh, there is a proclamation um, um, recording the significance of the day that we were able to open the South Tower that's behind you, uh, giving us the opportunity to care for this region in ways that we never have. And, and so on that opening night, um, his office presented us with that flag. Uh, so that that's the flag there. The uh, the second flag that I have um, is at our house, and it was flown over the Texas Capitol uh, on the day that my wife and I were married. So you know, a little a uh, little personal and professional significance, uh, and that was get... reserved for us. That was reserved for us by honestly one of our friends who just uh, contacted an elected official uh, when we got engaged and asked for that day to be uh, written down. 3307 and we've got the flag at our house that was flown over the Texas Capitol. So very good. You know what? I, you know, Chelsea is going to be, I'm very proud of you. You had that <laughs> date down. That was really good. 3307. I like yep. it. That's fantastic. Well, Justin, you have a lot to be proud of. I will tell you that uh, I've been to a tremendous number of hospitals in my 43 year career as a perfusionist. And prior to that, uh, when I was in the uh, service and then when I first got out before going to perfusion school. Um, you know, your hospital, if I, and I, I, I guess I can say a whole bunch of different words, but I'll put it this way. If I or one of my loved ones needed emergency care or any care, even elective, but emergency care, um, I am rushing to Memorial Herman the Woodlands Hospital you have some of the most outstanding people and there are outstanding people everywhere. I don't want to say that other hospitals and other hospital systems don't have outstanding people because they do. Uh, but in particular, your facility uh, really bore a tremendous brunt of everything that happened. You, I, I, I'm curious, how many hours a week do you work on average? Uh, it's a part of, it's a part of life. I don't know. I don't know how many hours, Joe, but it's, uh, uh -huh. you know, we, we wrap it up in our house as, you know, this is a part of, of who I am and a part of who our family is. And our obligation is to go help so, people. And so this is just what I do when I leave the so house, sir, but you know, suffice I, it again, to say I would like, suffice it to say it's more than 40 hours a week. Uh, I, yeah, I, I don't know many people that work just 40 hours a week these days. And there's, uh, and, there's uh, a lot uh, of people I would that think. There's a lot of people that think they should make 200,000 a year and work 20 hours a week. You know, so well, that's a you know, I, I think the best, yeah, I think the best thing is, is, you know, you uh, appreciate your words. Um, I always kind of looked at it that way as well. Would, would my, uh, would I want my own loved ones to be cared for, you know, at, at my facilities and such, but it always goes back to the team. And so you guys, uh, you and your team have been a huge part uh, and very, very much a, an integral part of this, uh, not only the, the past two and a half years, uh, but in, uh, but in other times as well. And, and that's, you know, where the team comes together. And if the team comes together, we can figure out a way to get through anything. Uh, I think that's and, the key. Uh, 
you bring up such a good yeah. point is, and, and I, I, I loved your three eyes, but one of the things that I feel that I have tried to do as an organization is not be seen as a contractor, not be seen mm -hmm. when I'm in your facility as an outsider, but actually a part of your family, in your, your work family in, in the hospital. And it is, it is a family. Look, all I can tell you is that you, uh, you, you, your facility is wonderful. Your people are wonderful. You are wonderful. Um, you guys do terrific work. You have some of the best medical practitioners uh, at every level, from the physician level to the mid-level. Uh, your nurses are incredible. Uh, your facility looks and smells like it should, like an actual hospital. Uh, and that gives people confidence when they come in your facility. There's a lot of facilities that have lost sight of a lot of that. As I said, I've been to a lot of different places and uh, you see trash and you can smell uh, waste and it's unpleasant. Your hospital is amongst the most well-run, well-organized, devoted staff, uh, kind-hearted people, and you keep, an, uh, you keep that place looking like it should, a place to care for the sick, and in a way that your, uh, uh, it, is, it is a joy to be in your hospital. It does not work good to be in the hospital, I go to work there and I don't want to be there sometimes, but when I come to your facility, I feel that I am in a professional health care facility. And I think that's so important. Well, thanks. We're, uh, you know, we're, nobody's, nobody's perfect and we're not perfect by uh, any means, uh, but it, it's the, fo it's the, it's the mindset of continuous improvement. And so Absolutely. again, you know, my, my job is to take care, to support and empower uh, all of our leaders, uh, all of our staff uh, with the same type of uh, mindset. And uh, yeah, like I said, if, you know, if we're all functioning as a team, uh, there's nothing that we can't accomplish. Well, Justin, you should be proud. That's all I can say is you should be proud. And I guess my last thought is you realize what a burden it is to be perfect, right? It's very, I mean, you have no idea what it's like for me when I wake up in the morning knowing that perfection is always expected. And uh, I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you carry that one, carry that weight. So it's a burden. It is a, it is a true burden. Um, also to be this good looking is very difficult as well. It's just all of it's hard. We need to meet up at the broken egg, another broken egg soon for breakfast. Thank you so much for taking your time to do this for me today. Um, yeah. This was very worthwhile, and uh, I'll share with you the comments that I get uh, after uh, when I when I have distilled everything down and can send you a, a little report of what uh, people had to say about this program. Thank you for your generous time, sir. Thank you, Joe. All Best right, y'all have a great rest of your day. Okay. Bye, bye, sir.